Hello everyone, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 569. Episode 569 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. Hope you're doing fantastic. Hope you're well and good. Hope you're fine and dandy. Hope you're keeping your head up and all that good stuff. How am I? You know, doing the best I can with the time I have available. As per usual, drinking the H2O, still on the 75 hard, still training twice a day, still trying to eat right as I can, drink loads of green juice and look as skinny as possible for my impending holidays. That's the vibe that I'm on. Skinny gang, skinny gang, skinny gang. Skinny gang, skinny gang, skinny gang. <laughs> I gotta love that fresh H2O. But anyway, what we're gonna talk about today? Many, many, many things to get into. I'm gonna make this more of a cultural commentary podcast than usual. No talk about COVID. So if you're worried about that, then breathe a sigh of relief. No talk about Ukraine because that's depressing as hell, especially the last couple of days. And I just don't know what use I have in terms of conversating about... Conver no, it, it, I don't know what... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what use I have. Yeah, talking about it in the first place. I can't really solve anything. I'm completely um, uneducated in terms of the politics involved in that country and what's going on in Russia. I just see people you know um suffering over there in that country a country that i was actually going to go on holiday to to kiev to go and explore their underground techno scene and now in a matter of a couple of months it's just completely been decimated and my heart bleeds for every single person out there ukrainians um you know mostly the ukrainians out there who are just suffering at the hands of this you know illegal invasion from flipping um, russia it's absolutely horrifying but again I'm not sure how much I can add to it, so I'm not going to talk about that sort of stuff. I'm going to not talk about the last thing I ended the, pod, the previous podcast with, which was all that nonsense that was happening on Twitter spaces, because I listened back to it and I was like, bro, no one knows what you're talking about. It's a complete, it's a it's a niche within a niche, right? You have, First, you have to be on Twitter to know that happened. Then you have to be somebody that listens to a Twitter space. Then you have to be somebody that's jobless enough to listen to it until 4 a.m. like I did. So not going to talk about that i'm going to avoid all that sort of stuff and just focus on some of the more uh, interesting topics that i have stumbled across on the social webs now of course the opening story i'm going to open with isn't the most um jovial story but i do think it's important to just be aware of our own mortality i think for for the for the most part i feel like in the west we seem to have a very divorced relationship when it comes to our mortality we seem to exist in this kind of um we seem to be um, happy in our bliss. No, it's happy. ignorance is bliss seems to be the kind of um, mindset that we sort of live our life with. As long as we don't see it, we don't believe it. Credit, debt, bills, whatever it may be. As long as we, we feel like if we ignore it enough, it'll just go away, which obviously isn't the case. And I feel like we definitely saw that with COVID, right? I felt like certain governments, especially within Europe, they were attacking COVID or the pandemic as if they could save everybody as if there was a possibility they could ensure that we got to like a zero deaths sort of situation or sorry zero COVID situation which if you listen to any of the experts even at the height of COVID they all said that was impossible you were always going to lose some people along the way unfortunately but if you wanted to um, ensure that the economy you know didn't tank that people's mental health didn't suffer domestic violence didn't go through the roof people's kids education didn't wane then you had to kind of take a calculated risk and accept the negative consequences of opening up society but also understanding that if you do so that you're going to lose some people too right you're going to lose part of your population are unfortunately going to perish some of them of course with underlying health issues but some regular healthy people will end up suffering as well because people are out and about spreading the virus bloody blah 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 so um it's pretty evident that we don't really like to think about death but i think it's important to kind of keep it somewhere within your mind maybe not the front of your mind maybe to the side maybe to the back i don't know but some it's something to keep in mind and the reason why i bring this up because it's this heartbreaking story courtesy of the new york post regarding a guy that i don't really know so because i don't really follow american football but i thought it was heartbreaking nonetheless steelers Dwayne haskins dies after being hit by a dump truck in south florida absolutely tragic and i think the kid was in his 20s or something like that madness right so the article says pittsburgh steelers quarterback which is of course one of the most um 
you know, prestigious um, positions in American football. I only know that because of Tom Brady. It says Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Dwayne Haskins was killed Saturday morning when he was hit by a dump truck while walking on a South Florida highway. Imagine how that must have felt being hit by a dump truck. A dump truck is essentially a, like a bin lorry that what we have here in the UK. Imagine how that must have hurt. Hopefully, he, you know, I'm, I'm hoping the, his passing was instant in some way, shape or form because that sounds brutal. I don't really know why he's crossing a highway in the first place. Um, to be fair, maybe, the, maybe there is a crossing there. But I do remember one thing. When I went to America, so a very long time ago, I went to New York, which probably isn't really um, comparable with Florida, maybe in terms of how big the roads are. But that's one thing that really caught me off guard. The roads are huge, which is why you need to kind of abide by the the flipping signs on the, on the street because a lot of drivers, first of all, they don't really check the roads there's a lot of i saw more people checking their phones in america than on the new york sorry in like a that two and a half weeks that we were there a week and a half than i've ever done here in the uk people are always on their phones because they kind of just go through autopilot they see a green light and they just assume positions are waiting so they always kind of blitz through junctions so you have to really stay and also the roads are like um deceptively deceptively wide the kind of like have you ever, have you ever played cricket before and then you think whoever's got the ball and you know they're going to throw it at the stumps is it right and then you think you can get to it quicker than they can throw it but obviously you can't physics so same when it same when it comes to the american crossing which is why you always have to wait for the green man to go so but yeah tragic anyway regardless it continues Haskins 24 has been in South Florida to train with um, other Seattle Steelers quarterbacks, running backs and wide receivers. The accident happened at 6.37 a.m. So he was probably on a morning run, probably going out to get some breakfast. God almighty. On the I-59, I-595, west of the I-95 interchange outside Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood International Airport. According to the Hollywood, sorry, according to the Florida Highway Patrol, Haskins was killed in the accident, but officials did not reveal why he was walking on the highway, said Lieutenant Indiana Miranda, Highway Patrol spokesman. He was just walking on the highway and got hit, says Miranda. The driver is in full cooperation with the investigation, she told the Post. Former Ohio State standout had been in the NFL since 2019, first with Washington and then as the third string quarterback with the Steelers. The Steelers re-signed him as an off-season or two a one-year contract worth 2.5 million so he was kind of bouncing around maybe didn't have a club maybe sorry maybe didn't have a team um trying to get his career restarted um and then this happens god in the off season oh my god it says here i'm devastated at the loss of um i'm de de devastated and at a loss for words for the unfortunate passing of Dwayne haskins says dealers coach mike tomlin he quickly became a part of our Steelers family upon his arrival in Pittsburgh and was one of the most hardworking people, both of the hardworking, one of the most hardest workers, both on the field and in our community. Dwayne was a great teammate, but even more so a tremendous friend to many. I'm truly heartbroken. Our thoughts and prayers are with his wife, um, Kaylabra, and his entire family during this difficult time. So yeah, RIP Dwayne Haskins, man. What an absolute tragedy. And again, a reminder of just how of just how precious life is one moment you're out on a morning jog or you're on your way to get a bagel or just hang out with some friends and the next minute you're getting hit by a flipping dump truck and your life is completely gone and all your family and friends are mourning your loss and it's just a complete shock to everybody um so do what you can with the time you have available honestly live life to the fullest and that doesn't mean you know indulge in ridiculous hedonism and all that sort of nonsense but try and live a full life that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to experience things fully i think a big part of that for me was going out sober more often than not um if you know my history of going out for the most part had to do with kind of raving and putting on parties and being a dj which n naturally involved a lot of kind of um involved a lot of drugs a lot of alcohol and just a lot of kind of ridiculous nonsense but then over time i started to understand that i actually loved being outside at night and meeting people and going to cool spaces and visiting interesting cities around the world and seeing how their nightlife operates i love that side more than i love the getting on it side and i wanted to experience and remember those experiences far more right than just it be a complete blur so i decided um to just kind of put the sort of drinking and everything else on ice and sort of treat going out as basically tr 
going out, right? Going to experience these spaces, listen to DJs, remember the sets. Um, you know, I think some of you guys maybe are having, maybe ha might have noticed, I'm not sure if you have, but some of the reviews I do when I go to clubs, there's clear difference of me saying, hey, I went to this club and it was really cool. I remember this, I remember that. Then the previous time, so it was just like a blur. I was just rambling about nothing. Now I'm clearly going with the intent of like trying to experience it and be f in the moment. I do little things like, you know, when I'm outdoors, especially in a new city, I don't use my phone or public transport unless it's, look, it's for directions. I try and I not have my headphones in. Um, I'm not reading a book. I'm trying to absorb everything around me just so I can be centered and in the moment and actually experiencing every single thing that I had to experience in that situation at any given time. And even more so when it comes to having conversations with people, I try to center the conversation, you know, with the person that I'm speaking to and try to maybe pry a bit deeper in their life if they permit me to um i try not to speak too much from eye and eye point of view and try and speak to them and what they're going through and bloody blah, blah 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 and maybe try and find some common ground but essentially just trying to have as many um positive constructive fruitful worthwhile whatever that phrase is um ex connections and experiences and meetings with people so that when my time does come i can be content in that i live the full life that is all I want. And I think that's what we saw with Virgil. Weird example to make, but I think part of the, as troubling and as upsetting as it was that Virgil passed, right? Oh my God, what happened to Virgil, right? Big up um, Little Dirk. That tune's absolutely sick um, with Gunner. But one of the kind of slight comforts about Virgil passing was that he absolutely went for it. He went pedal to the metal, even more so towards the end of his life. I think he got his diagnosis of um, cancer, like what, 2019 or something, right? Which definitely coincided with him just putting his foot on the absolute gas tank and absolutely going full throttle for it. And he, he didn't stop and he left in a complete... He left so he, he went so hard, he left flipping off white with or and even Louis Vuitton with like season after seasons of collections that they can essentially put out on the runway, you know, even though he's passed. So his spirit kinda of, kinda of lives on. And that spirit of hard work also lives on. But just in general, from viewing him through the prism of his own Instagram stories, we got to see how somebody can go for it all the way um, pedal to the metal and um how that can kind of lead to a very full life because for everything virgil did he didn't necessarily come across as the most materialistic guy either do you know what i mean like if don't go wrong he had these nice things he maybe showed up a couple of nice cars here and there but he usually kept that stuff storm and most of the times he was always sharing you know going to meet new people collaborations he was working on ideas or inspirations or you know stuff that he's seen things coming out like just experiences like sharing those things with everybody and i think that was really one of his kind of um true 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 um superpowers and something that i feel like we should all try and do in our little way so again r.i.p Dwayne um haskins like r.i.p honestly a true true tragedy um you know thoughts and feelings go out to his friends and family and everybody connected to him i can't believe that happened man it's really really tragic honestly really really tragic my god almighty okay let's move on from that one uh next up on the list what else do we have here um oh yeah it's a random one so there was a topic I saw online that people were talking about concerning pretty privilege, right? And um, how it kind of makes people just, you know, they can't believe that pretty privilege for some reason. And this person said the following, I've never met a woman that didn't describe herself as a seven. Most people are terrible at assessing their own attractiveness, let alone admitting it, admitting to it. Now, at first, my kind of thinking behind pretty privilege was a little, I wouldn't say archaic, but it was a little bit primitive. In that I thought it was a little bit it was a little bit delusional and silly to sit there as a person and say, Oh yeah, I'm as hot as Beyonce, I'm as hot as Rihanna, blah de blah blah blah, right? When you're clearly one. It didn't make any sense to me. Because I'm somebody who's quite rational, realistic to an extent, but I try to base everything that I do in within reasons, right? As long as it's not outside of the laws of nature or physics, everything is believable. But I'm also sensible in some way, shape, or form, right? And I don't kind of entertain nonsense for the sake of nonsense. So I just kind of always kind of put that in that sort of drawer, the nonsense drawer. But as time has gone on and I've tried to, and I've basically started doing my own thing, started to be creative, started to pursue like a side career as a DJ, doing obviously a bit of the podcasting, writing a blog, taking pictures, um, painting, all these interesting things that I kind of wanted to explore as a maybe career going forward. You kind of have to sit there sometimes and think to yourself, you know what, it is quite delusional for me myself to sit here with my 13,000 subscribers with my 5,000 downloads per month on audio with my um 
hundred something views on the video here and there, sometimes sixty thousand views, sixty views, sorry, right? It's quite weird for me to sit here and legitimately think that I could somehow someday be as big as Joe Rogan, right? It's delusional to think that. It's also delusional to think that what I have to say is worth anyone's while, right? Like what I have to say has any sort of value to the world. What I have to say is adding anything to the conversation or that anybody is waiting with bated breath for my opinion on on whatever random topics happening in culture. It's delusional. But I think it's important. I think it's important to be somewhat delusional like because it allows you to wake up in the morning and to pursue your dreams. Because if you weren't delusional, your dreams wouldn't make sense. Why would you think? you playing football in some concrete cage somewhere around the corner could maybe get you to someday playing on the same pitch as Lionel Messi. Why would that Why would that even cross your mind? But we've seen many, many, many stories, countless stories, especially with Messi nowadays or Ronaldo because they're, they're playing into their like late 30s. We've seen so many stories and instances of them taking pictures with little kids who are like playing youth team football and then suddenly, you know, you roll on, you know, 10, 20 plus years and that kid now is, a, is an adult and he's playing on the same pitch as Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi or some kid that was taking a picture of himself playing in some local cage somewhere and now suddenly he's playing for a professional football club. It happens all the time. And the reason that stuff happens is because somebody was delusional enough to believe that their little star, that small place that they were at beforehand would maybe get them closer to their dreams that they wanted to eventually get to. And because usually it's a dream. A dream is what it is, right? It's far-fetched, something a little bit um, out there that you can't really um, grasp. But it's meant to be something that you can kind of picture in your head and you kind of aim for. But you need to start from a point of delusion to get yourself ready to go out in the morning to try and practice whatever you want to do which kind of harkens back or links back to, I think, to this beauty standard thing or pretty privilege. Nowadays, pretty privilege and this kind of delusion that you're as hot as, you know, Rihanna, which I've always said, one of the most illuminating things to me that happened a very long time ago was that I was at a bar, I was at a nightclub actually, called The Yard in Hackney Wick. It's a really great place. It's like an alternative theatre space, club space. They host really cool parties. Usually um, they always try and host alternative parties. One time I saw a clip of them hosting a really amazing pop punk um, rave, which again, London is the best in terms of nightlife. We have the best range of music, in terms of musical genres. Maybe we don't go as long as Berlin, you know, we don't have the, the great time schedule and the security is a bit crazy and the drugs are horrible and the people can sometimes get a bit aggy. But when it comes to the music genres, in terms of the, the scope and the range, we, we, no one can beat us. Anyway, this place in the yard, they had a party there, I went, it was fun. I got talking to some random people outside the smoking area. I got, you know, doing what I usually do and holding court and, you know, bringing up topics and stirring debate. And somehow, actually, some of the girls I was talking to, I was like, oh, do you believe that if you had all the money in the world that you could look as hot as Rihanna? And the reason why I use Rihanna is a hotness because personally, forget I'm a I'm a fucking crusty looking guy and talking through a webcam on a USB microphone. Don't listen to what I'm saying, right? But for me, the reason why I said Rihanna because... I don't think Rihanna is like, like plainly wise, is like the most super, super, super attractive person. But what she has is incredible, like sex appeal and it factor. Again, she looks amazing, don't get me wrong. But the reason why I use Rihanna as an example is because I feel like her kind of sex appeal and it factor is something that you can't attain. You can maybe look like her if you want to, but that sort of cool, that swag, that just... St that kind of posture the way she walks in the heels like there's something about her that you can't sort of like you can't um bottle up and put in a pill it's impossible to do so but she's not maybe conventionally okay this woman is stunning in like a megan good way sort of way do you guess what i mean i don't know if that makes any sense so that's why i use her as an example and all girls said yes they all said yes i could look as hot as rihanna or as sexy as rihanna if i had enough money and i thought that was insane that you girls are in nuts out of your mind now in the modern era they might have a point because if you look at someone like a Kylie Jenner not to pick on the Kardashians all the time but a Kylie Jenner is a good example we've all seen that picture of Kylie Jenner hanging around with like I think she's with Tyler the creator and somebody else it's like an old picture they're in LA somewhere I think Tyler's on a bike or I don't know someone else is there it's like that kind of picture right um they're sort of like you know the new generation of LA kids just hanging around doing their thing and Kylie's pre-lip injections and she's pre you know whatever this version of her is at the moment it's just wearing regular clothes regular kind of white girl clothes and she looks so normal looking it's unbelievable Considering what she looks like now, right? She just looks stunning. You go for her Instagram profile, it's just like, you know, 
stunning square after stunning square after stunning square, a cute baby picture and all that sort of stuff and money. Like, just looks incredible. But she looks so average and normal there. They made me think, you know what? I'm, I think that delusion is is kind of rooted in some sort of reality. Because the truth of the matter is, if you have a good surgeon, if you have a good diet, if you have a good self-discipline, if you have a good work ethic, if you can work out a little bit, go to a gym or whatnot, and you can couple it up with some alterations and some help and enhancements in plastic surgery, you could probably look as good as Rihanna and look as good as and look as good as um Kylie Jenner. Hundred percent. So pretty privilege doesn't really become a thing anymore because it essentially means everyone can be hot at to some extent. There is no such thing as ugly anymore. Maybe you might choose to be ugly. You might choose to accept your reality and just, you know, whatever and stay where you need to be or stay where you are in that current point. But if you want to enhance yourself, there are so many options out there. Like I, for the longest time, want to get my teeth done crazy and people say oh you got great teeth no, no, no. but i always want to get them done so i want to get like a a gucci main sort of type grill and i've always said what what i want to do is i want to go and get it go to turkey get my teeth done and come back and act like nothing happened <laughs> yeah just act like the girls that pretend like you know i didn't get a boob job that oh no i'm just putting a bit of weight um i'm i'm, I'm accepting my curves you know that sort of nonsense that's what I'm, I'm gonna do but that sort of stuff getting your teeth done, having a facial as a guy, maybe having a beard and having it cut away to make you look like you've got cheekbones or a jawline, working out so you've got like a good chest and arms and whatnot, maybe getting shirts that fit maybe you properly, wearing trousers that are the right length of your leg, da 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 All this stuff can really take you from like a four to like an easily a six. Easy with a guy. Now, your enhancements aren't as good as women because women have the best enhancements when it comes to makeup. It's just, you know, that can take you from like a zero to a 10 immediately. But there is an ability to do so. So sometimes I think to myself, does pretty privilege even, does, sorry, does pretty privilege even exist? Is that even a thing if we can all be hot? There's no thing as pretty privilege anymore. Like supermodels, um, Victoria's Secret models, um, Instagram models, um, OF girls, all this stuff. Are they really that special if you could, if you want to, take all your money from work and every month enhance one bit about yourself or just keep topping yourself up and with, with whatever you want to top up, whether it's Botox, blah de blah right? And to, to get to the point where you start to look incredibly stunning and then guess what? What happens then in life? Usually the hotter you look, the less work you end up doing, <laughs> yeah? So you end up going to do an OF, opening an OnlyFans, sitting on stream and just ranting into a camera, like, and just being tipped and donated money and shit. Like, life really gets rosy for you. Like, it, it you know, you start to come, you, you look hotter and suddenly life is in Technicolor all over again. So I don't, I'm not really sure if Pretty Privilege actually exists. I don't know. What do you guys think? Does Pretty Privilege exist? Do you think if you got, all the money in the world, guy or girl, that you could look as hot as a Rihanna, you could look as hot as, um, I don't know, I don't know, whoever the hot guy is out at the moment, David Beckham, maybe somebody else is the hot guy, Um, no, what's his name, T Timothy Chalamet, like, do you think you could look as hot as that if you were able to get all the, you know, you had all the money and the access to designers and stylists and dermatologists and all this sort of stuff, let me know in the comments down below, I'd love to hear your thoughts, because I honestly think pretty privilege doesn't exist, it's gone, If if we can all be hot, what does hot even mean? What, what currency does it? You know what I mean? Like maybe that also explains why a lot of these influencers and celebrities are not showing us any material goods anymore. Haven't you noticed there's been a real uptick in celebrities showing you, don't get me wrong, the whole Birkin thing happened for a bit, but for the most part, you see a lot of people showing you they're going to Aspen, they're going to Cabo, um, they're riding camels, they're on jet skis. You're seeing a lot more of that than you are seeing people, oh, here's my row of Rolls Royces. Here's my Ferrari. Here's my private jet. People are showing you more like, yeah, even private jets, people are showing you their feet or them sitting in a chair as opposed to them outside of the private jet. They're like, oh, I'm going somewhere. I'm going on a trip. My passport is stamped up. Or oh, one one picture I saw actually, which was interesting. It was like it was like a bunch of um black girls, um I would call them IG baddies, right? And they had like amazing manicured hands, great diamonds all over it, and they're all in the circle with their passports and showing everyone's passport, like, you know, in a circle. And it's like, oh, that's a flex now. A flex isn't. So before, there would be the same girls who would have sat in a circle showing off their perfect pedicures and their amazing heels. But now they're all there with their manicures holding a passport. Um, you know, some in, in really de swanky designer passport holders, but mostly just saying, hey, my passport's stamped up. I'm on the way to somewhere, you know, luxurious. Somebody flew me out, all this stuff. So who knows? Main pretty privilege is not existing. It's not a thing. I don't know. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts and feelings about that one. Next on the list, we have the 
following. This is courtesy of Insider. Elon Musk hosts Tesla Cyber Rodeo Party featuring a drone display, flashing blow up cacti, and a vehicle hung from the ceiling of its 1.1 billion new Texas factory. From what I understand, or from what I remember, was this new Texas factory what Elon did as a reaction to that person in, in California, that um, senator or someone saying Elon Musk sucks or something or saying fuck off Elon? And he's like, okay, noted. And he just took his entire factory and moved to Texas. Was that a thing? Like, he's an absolute bad man, isn't it? Like, you got, you know, it's like, okay, cool. You, you don't want me here? I'll take my tax dollars and my um, um, employment opportunities and take them elsewhere to a state that actually wants to welcome me. Um, don't get me wrong. Anyway, rewind. I watched Cyber Rodeo and just off the bat, it was fucking difficult to get through. It was basically his way of maybe, you know, celebrating the opening of the factory and also updating people on the product range in terms of Tesla from the Cybertruck to the RoboTaxi. Now, oh, RoboTaxi update is really interesting. RoboTaxi is before when he announced it. The idea behind it was that when the fully autonomous sort of like um, thing happens with Teslas and they finally get to a point where you can safely sit in the passenger seat and have your Tesla driver you want, the idea was that if you had a Tesla, you could essentially activate a robo taxi mode that would allow your car to leave your driveway and go and pick up random people whilst you're not using it. And you could earn money on the side. So kind of like a remote Uber if you wanted to do so. And that was that was what it was going to be. So essentially you're going to expand the scope of taxis or you know just expand the scope of Teslas, you know, all over the world and obviously in increase their market cap and whatnot, blah, 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 and evaluation. Now it's changed. I think now he's going to have, there's going to be a dedicated car called a robo taxi which is i'm assuming going to be modded on the inside to accommodate that thing so there's not going to be a probably not going to be a driver steering wheel or whatnot it's just going to be a thing people can sit in and get taken around so that was an interesting update cybertruck update not really much they brought on a road legal version of the cybertruck to the stage it looked pretty swanky we saw the oh the update we saw we saw the side mirrors there's no handles on the doors it's supposedly going to just um it's supposedly meant to open as you come closer to the door but there is a sort of weird button sort of thing that you can press to kind of manually open it if you need, need be it looks pretty nice still doesn't look as beefy as impressive as the first prototype but you know still as a as a pickup truck there's nothing like it on the in the world do you know what i mean so that's still there but in terms of his presentation skills and again i'm not the most um i'm not the most um uh, articulate person in the world i still have my little ticks and whatnot but god almighty man it's brutal having him on stage talking about tesla like especially live with all the geeks hooting and hollering screaming stuff to the moon all this really cringe shit whatever it may be and it re honestly it was really difficult to get through and it made me think like god is really interesting in it in terms of how you're you know the skills and the gifts and the talents you're given whoever you believe in right is that your creator like you don't get given everything you get perfect life sometimes you get a messed up family you get messed up family but you get a good life after you leave your family do you know what I mean you not, nothing ever comes fully packaged and you know is a good example right super genius multi-billionaire you know found co-founder of paypal tesla spacex blah 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 right all this amazing shit but he has what what is it called has he got autism or some, something right um, whatever it may be but also he's not the best in terms of public speaking he's not the most charismatic person in the world you wouldn't exactly describe elon musk as cool do you know what I mean not really um but genius and he's trying to basically advance humanity obviously maybe to some personal um benefit but he still seems like a at at, at the heart of it he seems like a he seems like his, his heart's in the right place but anyway let's continue the article it says as follows drone displays fashion da, da, da. tesla ceo was the main speaker at the live streamed event which was attended by fifteen thousand people crazy prior to musk's entrance attendees were shown a 10 minute video featuring tesla's vehicles sorry tesla factories vehicles and machines and battery packs and flashing the firm's milestones such as the tesla owners avoided 8.0 million metric tons of co last year then followed a drone display in the skies near the factory, which changed positions to form outlines of the shape of Tesla State, Tesla vehicles, including the Cybertruck and the Model Y car, and the Shibuya Inu, a reference to the cryptocurrency Dogecoin and Musk's pet Flocky. Um, the camera in the live stream then panned over to the factory, giving a bird's eye view of what happened at the event. There was food trucks and stores, as well as a multicolored flashing blow up cacti. So it did look fun, you know, as an event. Um, obviously, you know, they're bringing up the team. A Tesla vehicle hung from the ceiling in one of the rooms of the factory. Musk then drove onto stage in what he said was the first production car Tesla ever built. Welcome to Cyber Rodeo, Musk said, sporting a black cowboy hat and sunglasses. And he said after he emerged from the vehicle. 
Um, in addition to outlining the size, yeah, look, that's how big the factory is if they put it up onto its side. Crazy, isn't it? Don't you find it interesting that there's, is it, did you interesting to say that, that there's different laws or it's harder, it appears to, to build upwards than it is to build across? Why is that? You're covering, you're still covering, if anything, across you're covering more of a land, more of a square footage, whatever it may be. And there's, you know, there's infinite, there's sort of quote unquote infinite space in terms of building upwards, but there's finite space in terms of building landscape wise. I, mean, I never really understood that. But anyway, continue. In addition to outlining the size of the Tesla, Texas factory, the contribution to the production capacity, the firm's plans for the Model Y compact SUV at Giga Texas, as well as the first Cybertrucks, which Mark says will go in production next year, must also reveal to the crowd that Tesla's humanoid robot Optimus has a shot at being a production version for one, hopefully next year. So you remember that um, Tesla bot, it's called Optimus that they debuted. That's going to be nuts when that kind of launches because essentially that could also be your kind of proxy de facto um, cyber robo taxi driver, right? When they first launched, maybe they could have that to be the sort of fail safe. If everything goes wrong, that robo taxi can kind of swerve and bring you to a halt somewhere. But the fact that they can have that to do manual labor stuff in the factory, you know, it's going to be a real game changer in terms of, you know, what we define as work, especially now in this post pandemic world. It's going to be flipping nuts. Tesla's also working on a dedicated robo taxi, said Musk, which um, is going to look fut quite fantastic, quite futuristic, he said. At the end of the Musk speech, Franz, Vol Franz von Holsen, Tesla's chief designer, joined the CEO on stage. They joked about smashing the window, the Cybertruck parked behind them, a reference to the von Holsen ill fated metal ball stunt unveiling of the electric pickup truck in 2019. So that I thought was pretty interesting. And then, of course to kind of lead on to that yeah to lead on to that kind of to kind of lead on to that we've got this news that happened just a few days ago or a week ago regarding elon musk and twitter and the headline reads as follows elon musk becomes twitter's biggest shareholder after taking a 9.2 percent stake to address its failure to adhere to free speech principles the world's richest man owns a quadruple the shares of the founder jack dorsey his passive stake is valued to be 2.9 billion based on friday's stock close it has prompted to a share price to soar 26 percent pre-market trading so a pretty t interesting turn of events right if you're if you're familiar with elon musk you know he's had a very dicey relationship with twitter a dicey relationship a dicey relationship with kind of free speech and because he's a little bit of a troll or a shit poster online it made you know looking back it does make complete sense that he would actually buy some shares in twitter at first when he was doing those um questions and surveys which now it's been revealed that he was do doing these surveys on twitter that he's polls about twitter and whether it's a free speech platform and whatnot um and by that time the deal was already getting sealed up to him to buy shares but obviously there was the ndas and whatnot and what and whatnot in place so people no one ever leaked the news and obviously i'm assuming that might have been insider trading if you were leaked it because people would have been able to invest in tech twitter beforehand then they got announced and share prices go up you obviously make a lot of money but that aside People at the time, myself included, I was just assuming he was saying those things about free speech on Twitter because he was gearing up to maybe launch his own social media um, platform. But what it looks like to me is that all the smartest people in the world are not trying to launch social media platforms. They're either trying to fix what's available or they're taking an active stand and saying, no, nah, I'm not participating in this anymore. But no one is really sitting there and trying to make the next Facebook, make the next Instagram, make the next Twitter because it just requires too much work and it's a kind of a fool's errand like you could probably i remember who said it the investor paul graham said it on twitter i think recently you could possibly if you had enough talented designers and developers and product people you could just clone twitter all the best bits of it and just make your own version but you won't necessarily have the user base right and um, that's the obviously the hardest thing to kind of build from the ground up which probably might explain why tiktok is valued as much as it's valued because they've essentially got an entire hold an entire generation of kids who are just kind of addicted to that platform but it's very difficult to launch your own so maybe it makes sense for him to buy into something that he thinks isn't working and try and fix it from the inside but it also goes to show just as a general rule of thumb in life it does pay again not pay it's probably way more if again if, if you got the funds to do so it's probably way more constructive and useful to try to get in the ring participate and try to fix things from the inside than just screaming about it like from the outside like you're just barking at the moon it was way more easier that way or making your own it's way more easier 
um fair enough it's not going to be no it's 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 probably way more constructive and helpful to the cause that you're fighting for not easier it's going to be very difficult to get it off the ground but it's going to be a far better um it'll probably release a far better outcomes because of the press you know around it um supposedly he's going to do a town hall sit down with some people at twitter to talk about what he plans to do with the platform blah 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 but i think it's a really positive step in the right direction personally for me because i've for the last year or so since the pandemic has spent way more time on twitter than i've ever spent in my entire life i think if you look back at my twitter feed from like pre-2020 i probably hardly used that space and now since the pandemic i've been on there all the time and i have to legitimately say like it might be the premier social media platform because I'll, I'll describe reddit as a social media platform people probably wouldn't but i think so reddit social media too i think it's only maybe second or maybe a close tie with reddit like Twitter is amazing for the news you get breaking for the different accounts you can follow around the world from the way the algorithm kind of plots stuff on your home feed, the Twitter trending stuff, the Twitter space has now become a big, big thing, especially for me in like football Twitter. We're on there all the time, ranting and raving after a win or a loss for our team, um, transfer speculations. There's been beef on there recently. There's been that whole note reality. There's harsh reality gnosis with the guy called as that sits down there the uk dude talks about culture events here in the uk in terms of you know black culture and whatnot it's really fun it's really really fun platform um it probably isn't the best in terms of original content generation like for yourself as a user maybe outside of fashion twitter i don't see a lot of people actually sharing interesting pictures or stuff they're working on it's mostly just like stunting having a good time funny shit well i mean entertainment it's not really anything else like that um, but as a platform it's flipping supreme and obviously to get your thoughts out there as a sort of like mini blog forum as a mini blog platform sort of thing it works amazingly so i'm not really surprised that he would try to get involved that way anyway the article says as follows Elon Musk has become Twitter's largest shareholder after buying 9.2 cents stake in the social media company, the world's richest man worth 273 billion nearly 75 shares um uh, bought nearly 75 million shares um a document filed for the u.s secretary of State. Da, da, da. it means tesla co-founder has more than quadruple shares of twitter founder jack dawson which is interesting who owns 2.5 percent his passive stake in the company is valued at 2.9 based on the stock's friday close and the estimated cost of the deal is 2.4 so he's obviously not buying it for the money obviously it's a good investment because for the most part i think twitter will survive an apocalypse but it's definitely a thing of him being like hey i want this platform to be far more enjoyable i spend a lot of my time on here it's brought me a lot of joy and if i can play a part in it i'm gonna do so the news prompted twitter stock to soar blah 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 um continues here must um share the must stake in twitter it's considered a passive investment which means he is long-term investor with us looking to minimize his buying and selling of the shares yeah and supposedly they put like a stipulation in him buying the shares that you couldn't buy more than i think 14.95 so you can't have a majority that's basically in it so that's what he's got is what you can have or to that you know to that limit he can't be the majority owner of twitter because i guess they got nervous because they don't like him as a person and he might be one of the other next big accounts to end up getting locked off anyway it says here um da, 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 we would expect his passive ink stake to no we would expect this passive stake as just the start of a broader communications with twitter's board of management that could ultimately lead to an active stake and a potential for more aggressive ownership or twitter said dan ives of the wedbush securities passive investment is a strategy for slowly sorry for slowly building wealth by long-term ownership of stocks rather than engaging in frequent trading which is often accompanied by additional fees and can be more volatile musk could try to take a more aggressive stance with twitter this eventually could lead to more um to some some sort of buyout um the, the the shares held by elon musk uh revocable trust uh, the, the mogul has raised in questions about the ability to communicate freely on twitter tweeting last month that free speech and social media platform he says i hereby challenge a single combat to the so yeah tr serving it given that twitter serves as a this is a tweet from him from may to march 26 given that twitter serves as the de facto public public town square failing to adhere to free speech principles fundamentally undermines democracy that what should be done is it is a new platform needed and obviously did a poll i definitely agree with this kind of um phrase of twitter being the public town square i think i heard jordan peterson say it once before too I mean, that might be the first time i heard it which is why i always thought in my opinion like him or hate him i always thought getting rid or deleting 
um, Donald Trump from all social media platforms at the time he was a sitting president of the United States was absolutely insane batshit insane because he said some mean things on there or he upset certain people like that was insane legitimately insane I never understood that there should be rules in place where you just can't ban or delete a sitting president's um, social media platform because at the time especially when he was being very volatile and sort of uh, purposely trolling people it was maybe constructive to have him be able to say what's actually on his mind on the platform such as twitter and be so impulsive that's probably a good thing you probably want to keep an eye on what he's thinking and how he's going about things so that you can kind of interject if need be or you can maybe kick, kick a fuss about it or whatnot deleting him from twitter if, if anything has maybe emboldened his fan base even more and i think there's evidence that this is just suggests the fact, right? Um, I'm not sure if the capital thing happened after his ban or before his ban, but if it did happen after his ban, it goes to show how popular he has been even in defeat, right? There's still people out there still saying, oh, Trump won, you know, he's still not my president in terms of Biden, all that sort of stuff, all that nonsense and the let's go Brandon stuff, right? He's still got a big family. So I think part of it was to do with him being deleted, but obviously the precedent was set with Alex Jones when that coordinated attack happened with Alex Jones I thought that was a bit balmy as well um I get the whole Sandy Hook thing but I just I don't know for me I've always been a free speech absolutist and if we're gonna go by the public town square thing if there was a wacko on the public town square spouting absolute shit similar to like those um people from um what's that church the church that holds up those signs that says God hates fags and all that sort of nonsense right those people you just ignore them they're in, they're in Oxford Street, they're in, you know, most metropolitan cities spouting all their flipping um, homophobic stuff that they're putting on placards there, you know, um, kind of disguised under the guise of flipping religion. They're all doing the outdoors, but we have a way of kind of just ignoring them and kind of pretending that, that they don't exist. If that's the case, why don't we do it on social media? Why does it have to be that you have to be deleted and taken off because somehow you have a platform? No, you don't. You're in a, you're in a public square and town square if people want to come on your platform and listen to what you have to say it's up to them but you shouldn't be removed from having an ability to speak that's just insane because if 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 you delete trump from twitter and you say he can't speak because he says mean stuff that essentially means he might as well not be alive you might as well not exist because when's the last time you heard a, a trump fall i'll wait but when's the last time you heard trump say something about the current things going on in society outside of a Fox interview or something or whatever. You don't hear it because he's, he's deleted from all social media platforms. He essentially doesn't exist. Like it's insane. And we do the same things ourselves, right? If you want to ghost or you feel like you've spent too much time on social media, what's the first thing everyone does? They stop posting on Instagram. They stop posting on Twitter. They don't like stuff. They delete apps from their phone. It's the same thing. It's basically like you don't exist. That's basically what it is. And when people see you in real life, they're like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in ages. Why? Because they haven't seen you on social media. So I think it's a good thing that he's going to be, you know, you know, a part of Twitter's board and hopefully he brings some sort of positive change there. Because I feel like at the moment, these Twitter guys are bugging out, man. They really are bugging out. And a good example of them bugging out is this article, courtesy of the BBC, that says here, Elon Musk to answer Twitter staff questions. Because, you know, on the announcement or post the announcement of him buying shares into Twitter, people were panicking, like panicking online, especially if some of the you know, tech startup, social media analysts sort of glitterati scene, the sort of, you know, the Muppets like Taylor Lorenzo and all those people, they were having flipping Twitter spaces. And who's the other guy that wears glasses and thinks she's a badass? That donut, right? All those people, they were having these Twitter spaces crying at the fact that Elon Musk is going to be uh, you know a minority owner of flipping twitter and i was thinking to myself like how does one guy have so much power how does he scare so many people this 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 type of dude right this very uncalled dorky um somewhat lame guy who is a super genius and obviously very influential in some way shape or form really really puts the the heebie-jeebies on some people out in society and maybe that's a good thing that's a sign of a good thing that he scares so many people um, going forward but anyway this article says as follows it says twitter employees will have a opportunity to hear elon musk out to hear, hear, hear from elon musk about his vision for the platform it follows musk purchase of a 9.2 percent of the social media platform in an email on thursday staff were invited to quiz the tesla founder and billionaire over his intentions and of course we'll get the full transcript later on so i'm looking forward to that one there'll be speculation there's been speculation of what changes musk would like to see made to the social network the company-wide meeting known as the town hall all hands are typically run by the chief executive or senior member of the executive oh imagine how cool that might be man you're working in twitter all this time the funny thing on twitter too if i'm not mistaken didn't jack dorsey do the whole like permanent remote working thing he might be one of the first founders 
from that whole startup scene or from Silicon Valley, quote unquote, who decided in a post pandemic world, maybe coming into the office wasn't beneficial to everybody. And obviously, especially if you want to Im improve or expand your workforce, having the ability for people to work in different time zones allows you to kind of poach the best talent. And it also allows people, you know, the opportunity to just work from home and to, you know, basically, you know, take their kids to school and whatnot, maybe do a, a flipping side course here, an adult course in the evening, whatever it may be. But I'm pretty sure they have a really swanky office building somewhere. Is it in San Fran? I'm pretty sure it was. I think it was Twitter. They, they made, they had some, before the pandemic, actually, they, they bought some amazing headquarters, right, building. And then now most of their employees are working from home. And I'm pretty sure Elon isn't a fan of working from home. So that should be interesting because I'm pretty sure he's like the guy that does the whole like sleeping in the Tesla factory to show his employees that he's really serious and he's, you know, doing everything he can to make sure that Tesla hits their manufacturing target. So that'll be interesting kind of little, I think, beef that they have. The company-wide meeting, the, the shareholders such as Musk are not usually invited to such events, let alone asked to host an open, open session with staff The Washington Post reported. Many Twitter employees have felt disgruntled by the announcement earlier this week that the entrepreneur had become the large shareholder in company and was subsequently invited to join the board. That's one of the fallacies of startups, isn't it? And I've worked in plenty. This idea that you actually have a say in the company's direction overall is just insane. That you actually get to question people's decision-making process outside of your actual knowledge or expertise or fair enough have a suggestion but the fact that they feel like oh you're empowered that you have the ability to steer this company in the direction where it should go is nonsense i've never understood that to be beneficial or helpful in any way shape or form maybe consider consultation is one thing but actually influencing stuff is mad like all that all that big you know big vision overarching vision stuff should be left to CEOs and co-founders and whatever, whatever your role is you should focus on that you actually help the company way more when you focus on your job and try and do the best that you can at it every single day they may be trying to guide and you know force no guide or kind of inform the overall vision of a company but they do all these with wafty stuff to kind of make you feel like you're part of the team and really in truth anyway whatever they decide to do they decide to do anyway so it doesn't really matter that's what um according to company insiders there's an anxiety over the impact it will have on social media company a bit to moderate content on the site they already ban everyone anyway i don't know why they're nervous about that um Musk has not specified what he wants to do the board member, but he has intimated that he does not intend to remain passive in the role with a recent tweet pointing significant improvements in Twitter in the coming months. So yeah, looking forward to that. Uh, big up Elon. I think it's going to be a really good change. Change is necessary. Even if it's going to come at this abrupt stage, it is definitely necessary. Oh, mate. That water is so lovely. Um, let's continue. Let's continue. Mm. What else do we want here? Oh yeah, let's do this. You see this article, this is courtesy of NBC News concerning the one and only Joe Budden. It says the following rapper Joe Budden slam for saying K-pop band BTS is from China. <laughs> it's hilarious because if there's one thing you can kind of count on Joe Budden to do is to throw out an unnecessary, um, unwarranted hot take just to kind of stir the pot. I'm not a listener of the Joe Budden podcast anymore. I've kind of stated my opinion on that, that, you know, I was really disappointed in the breakup. Um, I was kind of let down, betrayed because I was a huge fan of that podcast and it really did help sort of inform the way that I do my show in some way, shape or form. It was highly entertaining. Um, it did allow you to wallow and kind of, no, it did allow you to kind of, you know, pass the hours away, especially on a weekend when they did like a two hour pod two times a week with all these friends laughing and bantering and basically trying to go out there and conquer the world together one podcast at a time and redefine ownership and creativity, you know, for the creators, all this nonsense. And then in the end, Joe ended up doing what he always does to everyone that comes close to him, fucking them over. But you didn't expect it to be his friends. So it's kind of always left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. So I've kind of, you know, never listened to the show again ever since he did that famous show where he basically fired Rory without Rory actually being there or you're shouting at the empty chairs. Um, and then 
now I've kind of switched over and listened to the new new Rory and Moore podcast, which is really good. It's really chill, really laid back. Not a lot of shanting and raving. Not a lot of this sort of like unnecessary hot take McGee takes and just a really chill podcast. It started off a bit rough, but I feel like with the addition of Baby D, um, Damaris, like it's been a really cool show. And the other guys that are behind the scenes, they've really kind of added to my podcast in rotation. But I did notice this clip on the Joe Budden, sorry, Joe Budden subreddit where he said what he said about BTS. And it was quite evident at the time, especially during that week, it was a very slow week in terms of news. And if you're a um, sub-professed content creator, like I am, like he is, even more so him in terms of being a quote-unquote shock jock, you kind of always have to look for an angle. You always have to kind of throw out your unnecessary, unfretted opinion, because essentially those opinions have essentially made this guy a multimillionaire the more ludicrous and outlandish they are and the fact that he has no ability to feel shame or to feel ridicule or he doesn't pretend he doesn't but i think maybe he does feel deep down allows him to just go and say some absolutely nonsense stuff and this came out of the blue out of nowhere maybe one day he was sitting on social media and did think oh this bts thing is annoying because no matter what your feed is one way or the other because you know the the, the bts fan base is so rabid or the k-pop fan base is so fucking aggressive and passionate about their thing you're gonna see it sometime or not on your timeline and there's all these weird accounts where people put compilations together of their dance moves or of a certain member flicking their hair it's really really crazy but they have real stands about their shit and i just felt like you know why would you say this but of course slow news week let me just say the stuff just to kind of stir some reaction and it got me thinking in general about the term that i've coined hot tech mcgee i've really hated it i hate hot tech mcgee like i hate contrarian i've always thought in my opinion that you should always say what you say what you think as as, as often as you can obviously to some extent you can't always be 100 percent honest but you should try to be as honest as you can with everything that you say with any given situation especially when it involves yourself right like why, why wouldn't you be honest when it comes to stuff concerning you and probably even more so when it comes to stuff that's not concerning you because it doesn't involve your life but this constant need to always give hot takes i feel like in some way shape or form is a weird sort of like manifestation of this anti-intellectualism if that makes any sense people don't really write books anymore right they probably write an autobiography an exaggerated memoir but no one's really writing books no one's really like um putting together i don't know talks and whatnot i don't know no one's really thinking about things having debates like people are just like spouting shit online doing what i do recording podcasts where you're rambling into a microphone shouting and screaming through a camera or if you're on youtube and that's it but no one's really thinking about the things that they're saying thinking about their place in the world thinking about what's happening and how it relates to this and this and making connections here and there and trying to come up with original thoughts original premises trying to put forth a certain argument trying to bring down a certain political group or party um offering up an alternative solution blah blah no one's really doing that everyone's just fucking around and when you fuck around the best thing to do is to be a contrarian and to be a hot tech mcgee because it just stirs up unnecessary nonsense debate that makes you feel far more important than than you actually are because in that you know week or a couple of days that he said that his social media was blaring he had a little red you know and a notification um sign next to his favorite notification thing everything's popping off you feel like you actually accomplished something like yeah man i stirred the pot but really what did you do another hot take mcgee like it just gets boring as boring as it is to just be you know an unabashed contrarian just for the sake of it whatever popular opinion is i'm gonna take the opposite just so i can seem cool or different or interesting it's just like ugh, like allow it anyway the article says as follows bts fans are calling out rapper and media personality joe budden who on current who on a current sorry who on a recent episode of his podcast referred to k-pop band as being from china <laughs> that's the most in ignorant sort of like somewhat xenophobic thing that you can say in the world isn't it imagine if someone just said that about a black person like how people would feel it's interesting isn't it you could get away with saying just about anything when it concerns asians but when it concerns us myself you know the the menelin types you can't put a step wrong I dare you to say colored to somebody that's black, right? I dare you. I dare you to incorrectly say somebody that's from, Carib from the Caribbean is from Africa. I dare you. I dare you to, pref to refer to, um, um, to refer to us as darkies. I don't know, all these things are way more sensitive, but then you mistaken an, an Asian person who's from China as being from Vietnam or vice versa. You know, you just brush it off or you just say they'll look the same or whatever it may be. It's just mad, isn't it? 
It's anyway, the quote says as follows. I know they're big. I know it's China. I don't want to see it. Budden said while ranting about the band whose members are South Korean. <laughs> on an episode of Joe Budden podcast Wednesday, the four-year New York rapper, best known for it to pump it up, talked about how he much he dislikes the group. That pump it up. Imagine being best known for a track that came out in 2003. Like, what a career, man. But that also maybe explains what Miles said one time where he said that, how, you know, maybe he's going so crazy because he legitimately has never had this level of fame ever in his musical career. Now he's an actual household name, which is pretty big glow up, to be fair. Um, there's BTS there at the Grammys. I think some of them are wearing Virgil as well. So RIP him the great. He says, I hate them, he said. I don't want to see them dance moves. I don't want to see you come down from the sky in the middle in a little umbrella. But I didn't initially respond to comment or for comment. His co host pushed back, tried to explain, and he says, I don't want to see Korean N sync. And um I think he even said when someone asked him, I think it was Ice or someone, oh, but you have to explain why why didn't you like them? He said, I don't have to explain anything. I just don't like them. And then he goes on to explain. But that's a, that is typical Joe Budden. He's he's kind of personified, I feel like by his need and want number one by that so what story right that famous Josie story where i think it's about is it it's about a disc record i think it's about a disc record and joe finally kind of bumps into jay-z and basically tries to confront him about a record and jay-z's like so what like basically belittles him right like what are you talking about so what? i did it and what what are you gonna do now it's 20 years on like move on grow up right like you're a peon or whatever right dismisses him and then I think the other thing I think that encapsulates him or his stance or how he doesn't like to explain himself and he thinks he's above things and whatnot and thinks he's way bigger than what he is, is that story, minor thing, minor detail if you're a big Joe Budden fan, but the story of him being at the complex offices what he's doing, I think, everyday struggle and him having a beef with the management or whoever it may be because they wouldn't let him smoke cigarettes inside. And I think in his head, he thought the, the, the kind of the tip, the Mount Kilimanjaro of being famous or somebody rich was that you just got to do stuff regular people couldn't do for instance like you got to smoke in your hotel room you got to talk loudly in a hallway you got to maybe you know have someone open the door for you without asking like all these weird little things happen because people like want to suck your dick or want to you know kiss the ground you walk on he saw it as like a glow as like a flex so when he went to complex he thought he was going to be that guy in that building okay you brought me in as like I'm the cultural guy. I'm going to tell you what's going on so that I can, you know, and then part of the um, part of the agreement is that I can basically come in here and smoke my Newports and no one's going to tell me nothing. If anything, you're going to bring me an ashtray or you're going to walk beside me as I smoke and flick the, you know, the butts in the ashtray and whatnot. But it didn't obviously work out that way. And they had a very negative reaction to it. Told him not to smoke anymore. And I think he then said, I think at the time that that's when the red flag started to pop up. They didn't want to let him smoke. But that goes to show, you know, how he's basically thinking about things but i don't know i'm tired of hot tech Mc oh i didn't even have it on the screen did i but yeah i'm i didn't have it on the screen the whole time but hey here it is that's the article i'm tired of hot tech mcgee's i think it's flipping boring it's tired um enough move on grow up no one really cares no one really cares but hey what do i know we move on from that one we have to talk about what else here oh yeah, this is one. Let's talk about this. So this is courtesy of Vice magazine. Allegedly, a few weeks ago, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, or one week ago, Elon Musk got rejected from Bergheim. How amazing is that, right? As a story, to put out there on social media, as something to stir some debate and some contrition. Now, from what I saw, kind of browsing the Berlin subreddit and the Bergheim subreddit, which I frequent quite often, he actually was there. Now, there are conflicting reports as to whether or not he actually got rejected in the queue. We're not really too sure whether or not he actually turned around. We don't know. Um, but he actually was there physically. People actually saw him. And people, the reason why he was there, I know he was there physically because people said they saw him in Sissy Foss. They saw him in Kick. No, is it Kick Cat? I think it's Kick Cat or somebody else. Um, so he actually was in a couple of places. I think someone even said that he might have been at a Matrix Bar, but obviously not. And obviously the joke of Matrix Bar is that it's, it's terrible. It's like one of the worst kind of you know, commercial sort of like horriblest clubs you can go to in Burger. And it's, it's equivalent to like, this I have to say, it's equivalent to like going to, coming to London and the first place, first place you want to go to is Egg or something like, why would you do that to yourself, Jeremy? You know I mean? Or Old Blue Last, like, you know, come on, go to somewhere much nicer than that. So I have a bit of a opposing opinion on this. I personally think it's a bit of a piss take to reject him from Burger and, and kind of use it as some sort of like ha ha he he rejected multi-million multi-billion multi-billionaire dude i think it's a bit lame personally for me especially when you consider that he just built 
there's a gigafactory in berlin right so they're going to be building flipping teslas there he's brought back manufacturing yes he's done some questionable things when it comes to the local environment i know i know and again i'm not too educated on the all the specifics of it because i don't live out there but i still think if somebody is you know um if somebody is basically providing employment opportunities in that city for people and you know is basically restarting really manufacturing to some extent especially car manufacturing in that country then i think you should be given a little bit of leeway and a little bit of blight when it comes to getting into exclusive clubs like the burger now again does it add to the allure of the club does it make it far more cooler that somebody as rich and powerful as elon couldn't get in of course it does does it make it does it kind of add to the mystique of the club? Does it actually make people want to go to it more? Of course. The same way how, unfortunately, if you hear somebody, I think um, you hear Joey Diaz say a lot, whenever a really famous person dies from a drug overdose, you always say, oh, give me that weed that flipping killed Michael Jackson or whatever it may be, right? But that's the truth of it. The actual truth of it in some places in the world, when a famous person passes away from a particular drug, some of the local dealers will then start marketing the drug that they have as this weed is x weed uh, this weed is whatever weed or this coke is this from this person right that, that'll be how they start to market it because they feel like there's going to be a certain group of people out there who are going to want to swim in the dark waters who are going to want to come as close as they can to god as possible and have a sip of that or well, lean weed whatever it may be that got that person that made a person od so that is the case to some in some extent but i don't know i think it's a bit lame i think it should just let him in and it would have, imagine how cool of a story that would have been for you to be in Ber Berkheim one random weekend and then to be, at, you know, dancing, having a good time and then here at the bar and then suddenly this tall, weird sounding South African American dude is next to you. You're like, hold on, is that fucking Elon Musk? <laughs> or you're in a dark room somewhere and he's getting his schlong slobbed on. And you're like, oh, smokes, that's Elon Musk. Do you know what I mean? That, that would have been a far more interesting story, but I guess just seeing him in a queue while you're standing there must be super cool as well in some extent. But anyway, the article says as follows. How to get into the Berghain is an omnipresent question for first timers visiting the legendary Berlin club. Joining the ranks of this sweaty, nervous newcomers this week was a very unlikely figure. Elon Musk, the richest man in the world. But did the Tesla founder and the, fa and the father of Graham's children get rejected at the door or did he actually refuse to enter the techno club as he came on social media? That I feel like is the height of being a lame. And that's what I said earlier before about Elon Musk not being cool. It's a very weird predicament to be in like i said god doesn't give you everything god gives you something so he's a genius an absolute bona fide genius co-founded paypal founder of tesla spacex trying to make life multi-planetary building autonomous robots like you know self-driving cars crazy shit but the guy is a dork dork the dork the dork 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 can hardly you know can hardly speak Maybe it's to do with his autism or whatever it may be. Is it autism? I think it's got whatever it is. He's probably got that and the stutter on top of it, right? Um, is he blessed in languages? I don't know. Can he sing? No. Can he dance? No. Like, pretty lame, right? And all the, what, what is it? Like, he's into, like, crypto jokes and NFT stuff and Dogecoin. It's stuff like mm, corny, dorky shit. But he's a super genius. And I think part of the way of being a dorky person is to say stuff like that. Like, it's far more admirable just to go there and say you didn't get in than to come back and lie. It just doesn't make sense. It's like the person that lies about hooking up with somebody. Oh yeah, I fucked her. I kissed her. I did this. No, you didn't. I could just ask her. I don't want to. I don't need to because that's weird as well. Going and asking people for confirmation like, did he stick his pee pee in you? That's weird. But still, it's like, that's a, it's the same type of person that would lie about kissing somebody. It's the same person that would lie about not getting into a club or I rejected the club or I turned her down actually because it's like, come on, grow up. Um, anyway, this is the following. Musk, who just bought 9.2% stake of Twitter, has clearly been enjoying himself in the German capital. According to Breathlessly, Breathlessly, what, is, what kind of phrase is that? Breathlessly reported accounts that, um, in the Times and other publications, he has dived into two of Berlin's famed fetish electronic music scene. On his, uh, oh, famed, not two. Um, on his visit to European city, including a visit to Kit Kat Club, better known as the city's most notorious techno sex club, the Labyrinth Warehouse Club, City Foss, where he was spotted in a Zorro mask. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's, that's, that's a good thing to do, going in the mask. The funny thing about Kit Kat, which I why has never been, is that you have to wear like, basically sex wear, right? You've got to go in bondage and leather and PVC. And I just can't bother to get dressed up in that way, shape or form. I'll get dressed up in like a fashion way, but I'm not going to go and dress up in like fishnets and a choker and whatnot to go and party somewhere. I'm not really that bothered. And also I'm not that horny. So it's not something that I really need to bother going to. And when I saw that picture of a swimming pool in there, like I was like, 
it just imagine what a swimming pool must be like on a peak Saturday night, but it also looks pretty amazing on the inside. There's a video actually on YouTube, check it out of Kit Kat Club, where somebody does a tour of the whole club on the inside and the decor and the interior. That's part of the reason why Bellingham's have some of the best clubbing spaces. Like there are sort of these weird, interesting spaces that haven't been updated or had any sort of liquor paint in years. And it just looks like it's crumbling. It looks like a sweat and gonorrhea and chlamydia hanging off the walls, but it looks like it'd be fun. Um, so that's an interesting place for him to go to. So I'm assuming he had to dress up to go in there or maybe he got let in. Who knows? Um, Cisco, no, Kikap might be more of an easy one because you can buy tickets to go there. So maybe he was a little bit okay there. And City Foss is usually a place that everyone can get into. And it's a legendary space because it's usually open like 24 hours in a day and whatnot. Um, and it's got an amazing outside beer. It's got amazing like little huts. I remember there's a hut in there where there's loads of like smoke and shit you can kind of go into. Like, it's a cool little spot. Really, really cool. Um, it continues anyway. Did the, did but the real question is did the Berlin uh, sorry did the Berlin go into Bergheim? Is it, here's what they said. Um, they wrote peace on the wall at Bergheim. Must tweeted at three fifty one a.m. on Sunday morning, which is peak Bergheim time. I refuse to enter. Around three hours later, he elaborated on the incident, saying peace, peace. I hate the word. I don't know what that means. Maybe that was just high. Someone said he was blitz of coke, allegedly. He was just like clearly high in the queue. So that might have not helped his cause. As most of you guys know, standing in the queue at Bergheim, you have to kind of just remain stoic and quiet. It's, it's probably, it legitimately might be the most quiet queue you will ever see in your life. The most orderly queue. Maybe next to like the queue outside of an ATM, right? No one's really partying or chatting away or dancing or being belligerent in an ATM queue unless it's a queue outside a very popular nightclub or fast food establishment or like high street most of ATMs are just like people just standing there trying to check their shoulders and make sure no one's going to steal their 20 pound they're trying to pull out um but you, you know Berlin, Bergen queue is quiet like a mouse it's flipping it's like a church like it's literally like you're queuing up to go to church like so maybe if you're like smashed out of your mind and you're clearly sniffing and drunk and your nose is leaking and you're twitchy as hell people are like no nah, you can't come in when you're, you're already steaming you're going to be too much bother for everybody in there maybe who knows um da -da -da. Well, he says um he continues on uh he said um he, he said here we're quoting the line from roman juliet he said those who don't care about peace my self-aspiration included do not hear it and those who don't care about peace well i don't know Based on these tweets, Musk at least show at Musk, Musk at least saw the outside of Bergheim. The peace sign is a relatively new addition that currently stretches across the outside of the club in stark black and white lettering. You can see it in its Instagram post from French DJ Miss Kitten, who played the upstairs space of Panorama Bar over the weekend. So clearly he must have been there to see it, or he just saw the picture because it's been everywhere. It's been shared all over social when it first opened. And obviously you can see it behind Miss Kitten and um what's his name? The guy she did the album with. Oh, I forgot. Doesn't matter anyway. Um yeah, I just said, yeah, in her caption, until until ultimate live experience, period, speechless, donkey techno temple. Uh, it continues the peace sign, and the first thing you see, and you walk up to it, the letters of the sign are almost as tall as the top floor windows. But did the sign send Musk into a rage that made him leave the queue? Or was he, as, to, as multiple social media posts and pioneers said, speculated, simply turned away the entrance? Bergheim declined to comment on the story, the club has strict policy of not discussing anything that happens in there, which given the thing, kind of things happening in the dark room, it kind of makes sense. So where does it leave our billionaire playboy? Play, play, playful magazine founder, Philip Sanderson Bayer, is that you say, or Bayer, was there on the night, but didn't spot Musk. He says, it's always hard to predict who's going to come in and not. Bayer tells advice, it depends on the door crew's gut feeling of you. But our advice for Elon is not to come together with a big group and then don't care too much about the rumors of strict dress code. Just be yourself, Elon, and it'll be up to the guys and girls of the to decide on your future, which is a fairly accurate sort of a review. It's always annoying when you see those kind of reviews or YouTube videos where people are like going out and buying the most outlandish clothes to go and get in there. It's just like, that's lame. Why would you buy something that you wouldn't ever wear just to get into a space that you don't know nothing about? If you want to go into a space that you don't know nothing about, you should go in there as comfortably as you can in the clothes that best represent you. Of course, maybe show out a little bit, maybe dress to impress, but don't actually go and have a completely different new style that you would never wear just to get in somewhere. I think that's lame. Really, really cool. Really, really lame. So I like that advice. Anyway, the Bayer told Vice that there is nothing special about the number of people who get turned away that night. A cover on Reddit who waited around an hour and 45 minutes to get in says the rejection rate was quite high. And said if, if Mas did really attempt to get into the club around the time of the tweet, he would have been going to the worst possible time for a non-regular. Now, I don't really think that's true. I usually try and get there between the hours of like 2 a.m. and 8 a.m. on the Sunday morning anyway. That's usually my time to go. Um, the other times that I've been, 
I've also been that person that's been in, in there within the first hundred people just before it opened, you know, you queue around 10 p.m., 9 p.m., and you can get in there when the doors are actually open. Um, but usually Sunday morning is always the best time to go. You avoid all the big queues, and by that time, it's already heaving in there. Anyway, continues a crash course for the Burger Nightlife. We'll start with a list of peak hours, Rice Reporter noted in a piece of 24 hours in Burger. Da, da, da. Musk also however, had to wait for the, not, for the not inconsiderable amount of time, as you can typically wait for hours in Burger and queue at peak times. That's not to be sneezed at, given historic weather data shows the temperatures plunged to minus three degrees in Berlin that night. Does the man worth 273 billion like to wait in the cold? I mean, does anybody on Reddit, however, a user from the R Berlin forum named whatever his name is said that Musk actually made it to the front of the queue only to get turned away. So he did get rejected as saying. So maybe that might explain why he did that corny peace peace tweet without saying anything. Today they got rejected from Burger and Door. They, sorry, today he got rejected from Burger and Door. They posted on Sunday. When asked to confirm by another user, they replied, "I saw it." They told Vice. They told Vice over Reddit DMs that they saw Musk just at the home at none at none other than Sven Martka. Oh shit, Sven the big dog turned him away. Uh, Burger and imposing heavily tattooed head bouncer. That might explain it because Sven's very politically minded from interviews that i've seen read and heard of him he's very engaged um he's very aware of current cultural topics and stuff so he might be somebody that might have a an actual defined clear opinion on elon musk and his antics and he might think nah fuck him do you know I mean and obviously he's the head dog guy over there i don't think he works at pamela Ma, from what i remember he's trying to he's trying to basically hand it over to the other guys and girls that do the door and he's pursuing his photography or other things i'm pretty sure but he does come in obviously from special times here and there he'll probably be there for the easter weekend i'm assuming as well but yeah if he had rejected him then that's probably that probably did happen i would assume must recently built one of the gigafactories here in berlin and behaved extremely arrogant and ignorant when it came to the needs of the environment nature and people of the city said um casper lutina and arrogance and ignorance are both attributes real Berliners can't stand, including Sven. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. I still think there is a part of me that thinks if you're providing people with jobs, legitimate jobs, especially post pandemic, and you're bringing back manufacturing, you deserve some sort of leeway, some benefit of the doubt. Yeah, you might, you know, disrupt the local environment and displace certain people and let off unnecessary fumes and the batteries might not be the most environmentally safest. Yeah, who knows? Who cares? Let go bygones be bygones, but you maybe should have the ability to go into some clubs. Now, the, the best thing about Berlin, though, even if you don't get into Berghain, one of the best things about it, to end this topic, I can't bother to talk about anymore, the best thing about it is that there's, you know, you could throw a stone from outside of Berghain and land at another club. So it's not as if, like, if you don't get in there, you can't get anywhere. It's not like here in London where if you can't get into Fold or Fabric at 4 a.m. in the morning, you might as well just go home because there's nowhere else open. But at least there, there is, like... um there is the ability to kind of go to anywhere else and stay out until like early, early hours of the morning. So that kind of helps with the whole rejection thing. So you can maybe not feel like it's personal, even though it is. People say it's not personal, but it definitely is when you don't get in. So that can maybe help with things going forward. But yeah, big up him. He tried, he tried, he tried. It obviously didn't work. And now we're in this position that we're in now at the moment, isn't it? Um, next thing on the list here, I think, or maybe that's it. Yeah, maybe we'll end it there. Maybe ended. I think I was talking for an hour already, haven't I? It's been an hour. Oh yeah, it's been way more now. An hour twelve. Anyway, that was the excellent Dingo Show episode number five nine five six nine. Thanks again for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time tuning into a show, you know what to do. Um, follow all the social buttons, like and you know share and all that good stuff. Um, whatever else you may do, I will really much appreciate it. There'll be a song at the end of this podcast. I'm going to play as my tune of the day. So if you listen to the audio, you'll hear the full tune. If you're watching the video, you won't hear anything. So you'll need to, if you would like, listen to the audio podcast to hear the tune of the day. The tune of the day I'm going to play is Mountains by Coyle Ray featuring Fabio Foreign and Young MA from a new album called Trendsetter. So if you're listening to the audio, you'll hear that track playing next. If you're watching the video, you won't hear it because I don't want to get a copyright strike and whatever views I get on here to not be, you know, monetized. So if you do want to listen to the track, hop over to the audio side of the of the or the audio of the audio side of the podcast. But until next time, see you very soon. Take care and be safe.